Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. All praise you to Allah alone. We all praise Him and we seek His help. Whomsoever Allah guides is the truly guided one, and whomsoever Allah leaves us say none can show Him guidance. May the best peace and blessings be upon Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Brothers and sisters, welcome to another new edition of our program, Guardians of the Pious. Today's live edition is number 297. And it will be uh, the fourth in explaining chapter number 73. We've got only one hadith remaining in the chapter of good conduct and its virtues. The hadith is hadith number 630. And uh, it is collected by Imam Al-Tirmidhi, narrated Jabir ibn Abdullah. May Allah be pleased with him and his father. أن رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم قال إن من أحبكم إلي وأقربكم مني مجلسا يوم القيامة أحسنكم أخلاقا وإن أبغضكم إلي وأبعدكم مني يوم القيامة الثرثارون والمتشدقون والمتفيهقون قالوا يا رسول الله قد علمنا الثرثارون والمتشدقون فما المتفيهقون قال المتكبرون عبد الله ابن المبارك may Allah have mercy on him also mentioned while explaining what is the good conduct he said طلاقة الوجه وبذل المعروف وكف الأذى in this hadith which is classified as Hassan Fair Hadith collected by Imam Al-Tirmidhi Jabir ibn Abdullah may Allah be pleased with him and his father narrated that the messenger of Allah peace be upon him said the most beloved and the closest among you to me on the day of resurrection is the best of you in manners and the most abhorrent among you to me and the farthest of you from me on the day of judgment is asarsarun the excessively talkative and al mutashaddiqun the offensive wal mutafayhiqun and the companion said o messenger of allah we know what is tharsarun those who talk excessively and mutashaddiqun, those who are offensive in their uh, or abusive in their language. What about al mutafayhiqun? He said al mutafayhiqun are the arrogant people, al mutakabirun. Furthermore, the great Imam Abdullah ibn al Mubarak, may Allah have mercy on him. Explain good manners by saying Husnul Khuluq is to have a cheerful face, language, and extending the hand of support and refraining from harming others. So, simply to be well mannered, to have good conduct, can be achieved by having a cheerful smile. When you meet people, you smile to them. You don't turn a frown face to them. You don't give them that look. You don't look at them, the corner of your eye. You, turn, you don't turn your face away from them while they're talking to you. Talaqatul wajh. So that the person who's talking to you feels that you're interested in talking to him. As something that you can feel it. There is a difference between somebody, whenever he meets you, like a neighbor, he says, 
How are you? I miss you. How are you this morning? Assalamu alaikum. Kayf al hal? And he's like, you know, paying attention. He's enthusiastic. So you find yourself even maybe you're overwhelmed with some worries or you have something in mind, but he gives you a relief. Talaqatul wajh. The cheerful face. The nice language. Huh? The comforting words. And then he also said, Bazlun ma'roof, which is to extend the hand of support to others. Is there anything that I can help you with? In the customer service, in the countries who do believe that the customer is always right, because he is paying me, he is buying from me, he is making me prosper. So he's always right. They train their salespersons. Under any circumstances, the customer is always right. So when he returns the merchandise, and when he's shopping around, you should give him that nice look. How can I help you? Oh, um, I do apologize for that mistake. I'll try to fix it. How can I make you happy? Even though maybe the customer is rude, the customer is whatever. And that's why the customer is returning again and again and again. But when you walk into a store and you ask, can I find X large, size X large? Then you give him that look. Then he says again, and you ignore him. Okay, I myself would say, I don't need to buy from this store. I will just walk away. Okay, who's losing? The owner, the business. Because he didn't only lose one purchase. He lost a customer. And this customer, if he happens to talk to another, then you lost another. And third and fourth, maybe many people. Because you have formed a very terrible image. But when somebody happens to buy a pair of shoes from a store, then he finds something wrong with them. He takes them back. So the salesperson, the customer service says, please accept our apology. And this is a little token from us. And we'll definitely exchange it for you for free with no extra charge whatsoever. The man is very impressed. Then he circulates the word. So everybody in town somehow will get the word. That is the best advertisement. Uh, these guys are the best. They have the best customer service. Now we're talking, I'm just giving an example of dunya and business. This is how you become profitable in your business, successful in your business. You want to do business with Allah the Almighty? The best of deeds to Allah is sururun tudkhiluhu ala qalbi muslim. Is when you make uh, uh, your Muslim brother or sister happy. And how would you do that? Uh, Peace be upon him said that you cannot afford to please everyone by giving him cash, money, gifts, you know, <coughs> a little golden coin, a necklace, uh, a silver ring. You cannot afford to make everybody happy by giving them something material because you cannot afford it. But But what can definitely make people happy and pleased with you is being well-mannered. The best thing that you can do which will cost you nothing is a smile. It will cost you nothing if you have a good nature, if you're well-mannered, if you have good conduct. But some people, the smile, uh, it costs them a lot. They think that I, I have to pay for it. You know, they, they, they have it, they feel they're challenged to smile upon seeing somebody. This is not an Islamic attitude. Islamic attitude is that smile that you show to uh, your brothers, your sisters, is an act of charity from you. Like you're given in a charity. It is an act of charity as the Prophet said. And by the way, will you be rewarded for that? Absolutely. It depends on your intention. Why are you doing that? Why are you doing that? Why are you helping somebody? You're helping somebody for the sake of Allah. You're smiling for the sake of Allah to make him happy. You will be rewarded. So it is perceived as an act of worship. Uh, this is the, you know, it, we've studied before in one hadith that a person could achieve the status of a worshiper who's constantly praying at night and constantly fasting on every single day without having to do that because this is all voluntary, 
the unite prayer and fasting other than Ramadan it's all voluntary he can achieve all of that without doing it simply by being well mannered by dealing with people nicely and kindly so the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said when it comes to the day of judgment you know that in one hadith the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said inna min ahabbikum ilayya amongst those who love me most and I love them most some people would come by the end of time yawaddu ahaduhum one of them would love to see me even once to lay his eyes on my face to get to see my face even once even if that cost him his entire family and his entire wealth even if he pays as a price for seeing the Prophet Sallallahu all his possessions if he loses everything but getting to see the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam once that will make him the happiest and that is the best gain for him the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said such people are the dearest and the most beloved to me one of our predecessors was asked Sif lana al -jannah. can you describe paradise for us so he said fiha rasulullah in it there will be the messenger of Allah it's like you know what else do you need in paradise you'll get to see the prophet that's it do you need anything else besides getting to see the prophet sallallahu alaihi and i add to that lahum ma yasha'una fiha wa ladayna mazid what allah the almighty said insha allah for the dwellers of paradise that they will get whatever they will whatever they desire whatever they dream of and furthermore we have mazid for them we have extra for them which is getting to see allah the Almighty. Wujuhun yawma idhan nadirah ila rabbiha nadirah. Surat al qiyamah The faces of the people of paradise on that day will be so bright, lit with nur, illuminated with light. Why? Because they will be looking at Allah the Almighty. May Allah make us amongst them. You can achieve all of that by being well mannered, by having good conduct. So he said, amongst those who will be the dearest to me and the nearest to me in seats on the Day of Judgment, those who would have the nearest seats to me on the Day of Judgment, those who have the best of manners. And on the other hand, on the other flip, those whom the Prophet ﷺ would dislike most, and they will be the farthest away from him on the day of judgment are three types is to talk and talk and talk and talk non-stop and what is the purpose of sarsara There's, there is a reason you guys remember that we've been talking about the prohibition of arrogance and the recommendation of good manners you know, what happens is when somebody is sitting in a majlis, in a gathering, he wants to grab everybody's attention. If any subject is brought up, if people are talking about herbal medicine, he's there. And I have an experience, and I have a friend of mine, he is, and, uh, and I, I once experienced this, and I ordered that online. He always had a story to share. And he wouldn't give anyone a chance to talk, even if they are experts, even if they're professional. And somebody's talking about the different brands of cars and which one has a bigger engine. He steps in. No, 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 no. Uh, this one is 360 and this one is 420 and this one is 6 cc. No, this is better 8 cc. Okay, then we switch. Talk about cupping. He's there. And I know the best one who can do cup in politics, he's there. Fiqh, he's there. And he is none of them. He is not a faqih, he is not an expert, but he imposes himself through a sarsara, excessively talkative, non-stop. And subhanAllah is like a tape, non-stop. He doesn't take a breath. Why? He doesn't want anyone to take a lead or to begin a conversation. He doesn't give anyone 
an opportunity to talk. That is sarsar. Such person will be the farthest away from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Why? Well, let's learn about the etiquette of talking. The etiquette of talking from the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He said, "I was given jawami al kalim, the most comprehensive speech." So he would talk very little. And he used to be quiet for so long. He wouldn't talk unless it is necessary. Otherwise, he's quiet. Quiet, busy with zikr, busy with tafakkur, busy with tadabbur. Doesn't have to talk about everything and anything, whether he knows, whether he doesn't know. He steps in. No. He talks whenever it is needed. The Prophet often used to repeat the word uh, three times so that the audience, the average audience, will get it. You know, in, to write in the newspaper in America, in the, in, the, uh, in the local newspaper or in the Chronicle, or you write for a fourth grader. You write not to show that you're the most eloquent. You do not write Shakespearean novel. You write an article that can be understood by an average person, by a mechanic, by a janitor, by a high school student, by a fourth grader. Why? Because there is a message I want to deliver. What is the purpose of talking a very sophisticated language that 90% of the, uh, of the readers, once they read a few lines, say, I don't get it, man. Flip the page. Flip the page. You lost. You write in this way in order to show that you're very sophisticated and you're very complicated. That is mutashaddiqoon. Oh no, the Prophet Sallallahu would choose simple words. Not only that, it has been rated that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, whenever he would visit a locality, he would tend to speak in their accent, in their language. Some neighborhoods, they change some letters like, you know, in, 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 in English, Americans, North Americans, they don't say water like the English. They say water, okay? So he would speak to them as long as he knows how to speak this, and he would speak to them uh, the language. This is the language that they understand. Why not? Right? So once in one hadith, he said when he visited Himyar, some people in Yemen. Those people, they do not pronounce the lamb as lamb. They uh, change the lamb into a meme. So the word al-bir, it will not be pronounced as alif, lam, ba, ra. Rather, alif, meme, ba, ra. It, they would understand it. It's like, I am going to do this. I'm going to do that. I got it. I got it. So they say, Imbir. So the Prophet وسلم, said in one hadith in their language, Laysa min imbirrinim siyamin fim safar, which means, Laysa min albir siyami fil safar. Min imbirrinim siyamin fil safar. The purpose of your talk is to benefit the audience, is not to show the audience that you are very complicated and not everyone can understand you. Then, this is achieving personal ego, proving that you're genius, you're above all, and this is dislike. That is mutashaddiqoon. And also, when they speak, they ridicule people. They fill their mouth with big words, and they, they speak like from inside, not from the mouth cavity. Why? They want to impose themselves as superior to the rest of those who are sitting, to the rest of the audience. They want to make everyone feel that these guys are big, big, while they are hollow. They're not big, they're nothing. So the Prophet وسلم, said about al-Tharsarun, said about al-Mutashaddiqun, and said about al-Mutafayhiqun. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we know what is Tharsarun, what is Mutashaddiqun, but what is Mutafayhiqun? And I love to pause with this. This is the language. But since there is a warning relating to it, those people will be the farthest away from the Prophet Wasallam. They don't want to take a chance. They don't want to guess the meaning 
or assume it in case that maybe I'm doing the same. So I better avoid it. And that's why they asked the Prophet Sallallahu what is Al-Mutafayhiqoon? He said the arrogant people. Arrogance could appear in your words, in your talking, the way you praise yourself, the way you show the audience that you're invisible. You've got what they, what no one else have gotten. Always talking about yourself. So this is all dispraised, condemned by the Prophet ﷺ, and we should definitely avoid it. With regards to the statement of Abdullah ibn al-Mubarak, when he said, Husn al-Khuluq is, they have this beautiful uh, smile, and the second is Bazd al-Ma'roof, to assist and help people. خير الناس أنفعهم للناس وأحب الناس إلى الله أنفعهم للناس The best of people and the dearest to Allah are those who are useful and beneficial to people, to others. And if you can do that, if you can do any of the above, at least protect others from your harm. Zip of your mouth. Try to protect others against your own harm. Kafful Adha. Kafful Adha, which means refraining from harming others. That was the last hadith in chapter number 73 of Good Conduct. Before I begin the new chapter, I want to say one thing, brothers and sisters. <clears throat> it would be very easy to flip the page, or I could have mentioned hadith number 630 which is the last hadith of chapter number 73 in a minute or two in the previous episode. I'm not concerned about that. I'm not concerned about how many episodes would it take to explain one hadith or another. And to be very honest with you, um, I'm not going to say that I don't plan, I don't organize, I do my best. So I say, today inshallah I'm planning to explain three or four a hadith along with one ayah or whatever. And sometimes I spend the entire episode in explaining one hadith. Or all of a sudden, I get sucked in in explaining one ayah. Well, I don't mind as long as there's something beneficial that we may learn out of that. We've got all the time, alhamdulillah wa shukla, all the time that we're spending uh, for the sake of Allah learning, this is plus. Alhamdulillah wa shukla. We're not in a hurry. We don't have any... Uh, a commitment like I have to finish it in a certain number of episodes we don't have this alhamdulillah wa shukla. and that's why I'm not very uh, particular about that I gotta begin episode number 297 I must begin the new chapter it doesn't matter so inshallah we'll take a short break and soon after that we'll begin the new chapter chapter number 74 babul hilmi wal ana wal rifq Please stay tuned. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Rasulallah, Habiballah. Allah, Allah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. And welcome to another episode of Let's Talk. I could agree that uh, institutional racism does exist. Um, and uh, to be precise, uh, we should uh, define institutional racism and that is um, uh, hidden or non-apparent racism within uh, an organization or an institution. Um, I have witnessed it, maybe in uh, half Saudi, my last name is Arab. Mm. So when I moved to the States back in 2002, after the incidents of 9-11, um, I did uh, face uh, some racism. I think it can be what you do, but in the sense of without thinking. The things you do naturally without having to stop and think, that just come out. Okay. You know, the, 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 this innate nature of you and uh, how you think and, what, and, and, your, and the way you see things. Can, we can get your insights on the two different countries, inshallah, further on into this conversation. Mm -hmm. uh, Mamadou, if I can come to you, uh, what's your thoughts on institutional racism, especially in the UK? Do you think it's really prevalent there? The way we live, it's, it's, kind, it's kind of a combination of two things. The, uh, our language and then our, what we believe in. 
So if we have got a language without believing in something, so it will be useless. So we have, we have, we have, we have to get like both things going together. I'm calling your name. Now that we know more about da'wa, what would you say are the characteristics of a da'i? Sincerity. Sincerity? Yes? Good relation with Allah. Good relation with Allah. Okay. Patience. Yes, sir. Good manners. Good manners. And there is much more to that. Join us in our program, the Da'wa Workshop, by your brother, Dr. Rayyan Fozi Arab, so that we could talk more about Da'wa exclusively on Huda TV. <laughs> Islam. It's calling us to establish this hiwar, this dialogue between ourselves and between the non-Muslims, to use hikmah. The waves are coming, you're trapped, fitna every is coming everywhere. How, how can I get out of this fitna that I'm in? Ah, uh, send me the rope. Why did Allah send the Quran to you, to all of mankind? As a source of guidance, as a, as a kitab, a blessed book to be reflected upon. And secondly, the bath, the resurrection. Preparing yourself for Yom Al-Qiyamah when you're going to stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is Aqeedah, this is the core of Aqeedah, this is the focus of the Quran. They want these dialects and these slangs to spread so the Arabs themselves can't even understand the Quran properly. This is a, ch this is a choice you have to make now. Because once the angel of death comes to you and takes your soul, there's no turning back, there's no other choice. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome back. Our phone numbers beginning with the area code are 002 then 0235132 and the other number is area code 002 then 0100. Five four six nine three two three. The email address is gardens at huda dot tv. The new chapter, chapter number seventy four, uh, is about al hil, wal ana, wal rifq. What is hil? Forbearance. Halim, forbearing. Al halim is one of Allah's beautiful names, the most forbearing. Al-Ana is the opposite of hastiness, to be hasty, to rush. So it is prudence. Al-Rifq is kindness and gentleness. So we see that the teachings of this beautiful religion are all great. So far what we have been learning to be kind, to be gentle, to be forbearing, to be forgiving, to be patient and were forbidden against arrogance, against oppression, against lying, against showing off. This is what we've been studying. What did the Prophet say? in a very comprehensive message to cover up his entire mission. What was he sent? He said, I have been sent exclusively to perfect good manners. He didn't dismiss that before his mission there used to be some good manners. He attended Hilf al-Fudul, the Fudul League to assist the weak and the oppressed. And he said, I would like to exchange it 
for the entire dunya, no matter what happens. And if I'm invited to another league or committee after Islam and after I have been appointed as a prophet, لأجبت. ولو دعيت لمثله في الإسلام لأجبت. I would not hesitate to join in. Why? Because it's something good. But when he was commissioned with the prophethood and he was commanded to convey the message, he started declaring what is good and what is categorized as good manners and what is evil. When Jafar ibn Abi Talib رضي الله عنه represented Muslims before the Nagas and Najashi, the Abyssinian king, they immigrated. They were about over like 101 or two or three immigrants the Meccans sent two envoys, one of whom was Amr ibn al-As, in order to bribe the courtiers of al-Najashi to convince them, to convince al-Najashi to hand over the Muslim immigrants to the Meccans so that they can torture them and execute them. Amr ibn al-As was very eloquent. He phrased his words in a way in order to make the Nagas angry so that he would kick out and exile Muslims so that the Meccans would collect them and resume their tush. What happened? The Nagas was a just man, as the Prophet ﷺ predicted. And uh, he said, I won't be able to hand them over to you before I hear from them. Then they invited them to his palace. And their spokesman was Ja'far ibn Abi Talib radiallahu an. Tell us. Why did you leave the religion of your forefathers? And he did not join any other religion, like my religion, for instance, the Najash was Christian. And he did not enter Judaism. He did not enter one of those uh, you know, famous religions. He entered into a totally new religion. Why? He said, Ya Ayuhal Malik, O King, Kunna qawman ahla jahiliyyah. We used to be living in, ignor in ignorance before Islam. Nusi ul jiwar. We used to be very bad neighbors. Ya'kulu al qawiyu min al da'if. The powerful amongst us would devour and attack the weak. We used to do this, we used to do that, and he listed a list of bad manners that before Islam they were very common in the peninsula amongst the Arabs. فأرسل الله عز وجل رسولا إلينا نعرف نسبه وصدقه وأمانته. So Allah the Almighty sent to us a messenger who is one of us. We already know his family lineage. He is not unknown. He is not anonymous. He is known to us. We recognize his honesty. We recognize his honor. We recognize his truthfulness. And he commanded us to worship Allah alone and to not to associate with him any in worship. And he commanded him to be good to our neighbors, to be good to our relatives, to be good to our parents. And he commanded us and he enjoined upon us good manners. And he forbade us against killing, stealing, lying, and all bad manners. The king was very convinced and said, you guys are most welcome to live in my country freely. And he dismissed Amr ibn al-As and the other envoy and said, uh, I would not send them with you. These guys seem to be very honest and to follow an honest messenger, even though he was a Muslim. So the catch is, this is the Islamic message. This is what we need to propagate through actions first, not only verbally, not through only talking, through dealing with Everyone, Muslims, and Muslims, human beings, animals, uh, the uh, the greens, you know, to respect everything that exists with a life or lifeless objects. The Prophet sallallahu said in the very famous hadith of Mu'ad ibn Jabal and Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, may Allah be pleased with him. Ittaqillaha haythu ma kunt. وأتبع السيئة الحسنة تمحوها وخالق الناس بخلق حسن. So fear Allah wherever you may be at. Follow the evil deed with one which is good, it shall erase it. And be well mannered in your relationship with people. 
not only with Muslims, with all people, Muslims and non-Muslims. This is the Islamic message that needs to be propagated. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa Sister Aisha from the KSA. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. This is Sister Asiya from KSA. Uh, Sister Asiya, assalamu alaikum and welcome to the yes. program. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Sheikh Jazakallah khair for your a very nice explanation to each and every hadith and the ayat which you mm-hmm. quote. And we really need that. We don't want in the, anything in a hurry. Whatever, alhamdulillah, you are giving it, if we feel as if the thing is, the, that matter is going in front of us. So, alhamdulillah, as you are satisfied by giving the whole time to that part of the hadith, and I think so, on behalf of all the audience, I feel that we are also very much satisfied with that. If we would be in hurry, we would have not gained that much. Jazakallah khair for all your efforts. Sister Asya, thank you so much. I appreciate it. May Allah accept from all of us. May Allah grant us, grant us sincerity. Ameen. Um, so, let's indulge into this beautiful teaching in the chapter, chapter number 74, which deals with al-hilm, al-ana, al rift Is there any other word which, which spells the same? Hulm. Yeah, but that is referring to dreams. But helm refers to forbearance. And what is forbearance? What does it mean to be forbearing? By the way, forbearance comes normally whenever the person is very angry. And whenever your opponent or the other party deserves to be punished. Like if we look into the ayah of Surah Al-Isra, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِ I would like the brothers to take it out first so that we can look into this ayah and learn why Allah the Almighty put that name in this ayah. But for now, Al-Hilm is to control yourself whenever you're very infuriated and angry. Whenever you're very angry, so you control your temper. Look at the beautiful ayah. The ayah of Surah Al-Isra 44, Allah the Almighty says, تُسَبِّحُ لَهُ السَّمَاوَاتُ السَّبْعُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَمَنْ فِيهِنْ وَإِنْ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ إِنَّهُ كَانَ حَلِيمًا غَفُورًا Look the heavens and the earth and what is in both of them, the seven heavens and the earth and what is in between and what is in both of them, the dwellers of both, they all glorify the praise of Allah. They all worship and glorify His praise. Then, وَإِن مِّن شَيْءٍ إِلَّا يُسَبِّحُ بِحَمْدِهِ And there is not a thing but it glorifies the praise of Allah. وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ But you do not understand the way of their tasbih, the way they glorify the Lord. You don't understand. They have their own language. They have their own way. The birds used to do tasbih with Prophet Solomon, peace be upon him, with Prophet David, Peace be upon him. Then Allah the Almighty ended up the ayah with two of his beautiful names. Indeed, he is ever Haliman Ghafura. We know Ghafura means most forgiving. What is Haliman? Most forbearing. Why? Because if all the creatures, with the exception of Al-Insan and Al-Jan, mankind, 
and gen kind. With the exception of these two creations, the human beings and the jinn, otherwise everything, everything do tasbih. The mountains, the birds, the animal kingdom, the trees, the plants, the sun, the moon, وَلَكِنْ لَا تَفْقَهُونَ تَسْبِيحَهُمْ When it comes to us as human beings, he says, وَكَثِيرٌ مِّنَ النَّاسِ وَكَثِيرٌ حَقَّ عَلَيْهِ الْعَذَابِ Many of people are due to be punished because they disbelieve in Allah the Almighty. وَلَا تَجِدُ أَكْثَرَهُمْ شَاكِرِينَ you will not find most of mankind grateful to Allah the Almighty. Most of people do not believe in Allah the Almighty. Nowadays, 7.5 billion human beings who truly worships Allah out of this number. Very minority. And out of 1.5, 6 or 7 billion human beings who are Muslims, how many of them are regular in their prayer? Those who supposedly, they know who's Allah, who's Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa and they are supposed to know their duties towards Allah, towards their deen. How many of them actually pray? Compare between Friday prayer in, in a country like in our country here, or any of the Arabic countries. On Friday prayer, you see people praying they are outgrowing the masajid. All the masajid are full. And those who are praying outside are triple the number of those who are praying inside. So all those people, they only come for Friday Jumu'ah prayer. Yes, sir. And the rest of the five daily prayers, you don't see them. You go to pray Fajr. Beautiful masjid. Very pleasant recitation. Nice melodious voice. A great reciter, very peaceful weather, and it makes you feel like you are in heaven. And where is everybody else? Missing. Aisha prayer, likewise. And during the day, we're busy, Sheikh, busy earning our living. And it is like that. So Allah the Almighty says that He meets our negligence and ungratefulness with patience and forbearance otherwise Allah the Almighty if he were to rush the punishment ma taraka ala dhahriha min dabbah he would not leave on the face of the earth any single living creature because of our shortcomings because we did not worship, worship Allah as it should be as he should be worshipped so that's why there comes the name Al Halim, along with Al Maghfara. So he forgives because he's forbearing. You understand? Otherwise, if Allah the Almighty is going to hold us accountable for our shortcomings, if Allah the Almighty is going to account people because of their because of their what? of their own earning because of what they have done or because of their negligence why? because he is halim you see the link between إنه كان حليما غفورا in آية number 44 of Surah Al-Isra. So here Allah the Almighty begins, uh, or uh, the, the chapter begins with آية number 134 of Surah Al-Imran, which we studied before again. We studied this آية before in the previous chapter. When Allah the Almighty stated, um, وَسَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ مَنْ رَبِّكُمْ وَجَنَّةٍ عَرْضُهَا السَّمَاوَاتُ وَالْأَرْضُ وَعِدَّةٍ مُتَّقِينَ It's a divine call upon the believers to race, to rush, to compete with one another, to enter paradise. But to enter paradise, you need to achieve first forgiveness. Then سَارِعُوا إِلَى مَغْفِرَةٍ 
Be quick to words forgiveness from your Lord. And paradise as wide as the heavens and the earth. Prepared for the righteous. Who are they? Those who spend in prosperity and in adversity. And al kadimin al ghaid those who uh, suppress their anger, restrain their temper, and al afina an nas and those who pardon people. Wallahu yuhibbu al muhsinin, and Allah loves the good doers. So the qualities here which Allah the Almighty admires and He loves, which will make people eligible to enter paradise after being forgiven is suppressing your anger, controlling your temper, and pardoning people. And we've mentioned before that it is ascending. Kazmul ghayr sometimes is affordable. Okay? But to pardon those who have hurt you, those who have offended you, and those who may have transgressed against you morally or even physically, it's a lot harder than mere suppression or controlling your anger that's why Allah the Almighty followed that by saying and Allah loves the good doers so if you do so you will be loved by Allah the Almighty a man once asked the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam awsini advise me he said la taghdab he said don't get mad <laughs> don't get angry well if you read the advice as is like don't get angry this is not practical. But la taghdab here means do not do the things which will make you get angry. Do not put yourself in circumstances which you know that it will make you get angry and lose your temper. And if you get angry, do not act upon your anger. Do not let anger control you. Do not let anger and temper dictate to you what you should do. Because if you do, then you will lose. So لا تغضب, it doesn't mean don't get angry. Literally. It means try to avoid the things which will make you get angry. The Prophet ﷺ explained. He said that if you feel that you're getting angry, if you're standing, sit down. If you're sitting down, lie down. Or change your position. Or be dismissed. Make wudu. The Prophet ﷺ said, Don't you see the redness in his face? This is fire from Satan. And Satan is created from fire. And nothing puts out fire better than water. So extinguish this fire, this anger, with water. Get up and make wudu. And this is how you avoid anger. And if you do, you feel much better. Say, SubhanAllah, I was about to do something terrible. Somebody was about to divorce his wife. Somebody spent the rest of his life regretting that he got angry once. Brothers and sisters, I've been working as a chaplain in an American uh, prisons, in the American prisons for, um, for more than a decade. And some people, some prisoners and inmates in America are spending the rest of their lives in prison for a crime that they could have avoided it. Why? They lost their temper. He is carrying his shotgun next to him or next to her. And somebody cut them, maybe by mistake, you know. Or somebody forgot to put the signal. They, they picked up a fight for any insignificant reason. Tuck, tuck. And they pulled the trigger. He thinks by that he's a cowboy behind bars forever. Doesn't he regret? Of course. If he was given the choice to have the same circumstances and to see how is he going to react, he say, I would just sit down. I would just shut up. I wouldn't do anything. Because he beats himself every day and he blames himself for being foolish, for acting upon his anger. For the anger can cause you to divorce your wife, can cause you to take the life, the innocent life, can cause you to harm others, can cause you to do things and then later on you will say I was an idiot I'm stupid why did I do that I could have avoided all of that you pay the rest of your life as a price for that so the Prophet ﷺ guided us 
how to suppress your anger. He, first of all, Allah Almighty mentioned the quality and the virtues of this quality. And the word kazimin shows that it isn't easy. I don't want anyone to say, oh, okay. No, al kazimin al ghayr kazm, to suppress. It is hard, it is difficult. But because of the compensation, it is great. Yeah, I will. When Allah Almighty said to Abu Bakr Siddiq, Ala tuhibbuna an yaghfir Allahu lakum? Won't you love Allah to forgive your sin? Yes, Allah, I love to. Okay, resume your sadaqah to the person who insulted your daughter, the Prophet's wife. No problem, I don't care. Because it is not about the person, Mistah. It's not about the person who hurt me or hit my car or insulted my parents or did whatever. It's about me. It's about being saved. It's about getting the kind of compensation from Allah the Almighty which will make me successful forever, whether in this life or in the hereafter. وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسُ وَسَيِّدْ And those who pardon people, and this is a high quality of course, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forget, nor does He neglect anything that you do for His sake. Allah loves it because He loves the good doers. وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ And He will reward them accordingly. Brothers and sisters, by that we've come to the end of today's edition of uh, our program, Gardens of the Pious. Until next week, I leave you all in the care of Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Allah, our God, is the greatest, the one and only glory to Him. He born in humans to be the best and give His best religion to them. So why did they ignore that, forgetting all about Him in paradise, worshipping cows, fire and stones, selling the best with the cheapest price? So why did they ignore that, forgetting all Worshipping cows, fire and stones Selling their best with the cheapest price Rasulallah, Habib Allah